Okay, well, how are you doing today? Welcome back to Soul Invictus. And so basically we're going to go on and we are going to talk about the rest of the Secret Book of John. So that's kind of what I have for today. It's not going to be too much, really. Kind of finishing, wrapping it up here. I sort of skipped over a certain section here, but it's basically all the angels and demons that put together the body, apparently. So i um, just going to start up here with... Um, uh, yeah, basically, uh, Adam receives a spirit, and then the next part is the imprisonment of humanity, and so I just kind of decided to title that way, because that's how far I am with the, uh, with the book right here, so I think I got like four or five pages or so, so let's go ahead and do this. Uh, if you want to check it out right here, I have it here as well, and you can go to this site, it's actually called uh, www.gnosis.org so G-N-O-I-S and you can go check it out there and you can read it there too if you want I'm just going to kind of put this away for now and I'll, live, I'll leave a link down below if you want as well uh, but I don't really need I don't really need all that so I think um, if you want to see it I'll try to put it in there at the end but um, let's just start here with Adam receives spirit and life um, so I think that'll be good all right Adam receives spirit and life all the angels and demons work together until they fashion the cycle body but for a long time their creation did not stir or move at all when the mother wanted to take back the power she had relinquished to the first ruler, she prayed to the most merciful mother-father of the all with the sacred command of the mother-father, sent five luminaries down upon the place of the angels of the first ruler. They advised him so that they might recover the mother's power. They said to Yaldabaoth, Breathe some of your spirit into the face of Adam, and the body will arise. He breathed, his, he breathed his spirit into Adam. The spirit is the power of his mother, but he did not realize this because he lives in ignorance. The mother's power went out of Yaldabaoth and into the psycho body that had been made to be like the one who is from the beginning. The body moved and became powerful, and it was enlightened. At once the rest of the powers became jealous. Although Adam came into being through all of them, they gave po their power to this human. Adam was more intelligent than the creators and the first ruler. When they realized that Adam was enlightened and could think more clearly than they and was stripped of evil, they took and threw Adam into the lowest part of the whole material realm. The blessed, benevolent, merciful mother-father had compassion for the mother's power that had been removed from the first ruler. The archons might be able to overpower the cycle perceptible body once again. So with its benevolent and most merciful spirit, the mother father sent a helper to Adam, enlightened insight, who is from the mother father and who is called life. She helped the whole creature, laboring with it, restoring it to its fullness, teaching it about the descent of the seed, teaching it about the way of ascent, which is the way of descent. Enlightened insight was hidden within Adam so that the archons might not recognize her, but that insight might be able to restore what the mother lacked. And so, um, I don't know, maybe I'll put it back up here real quick. But yeah, if you want to go check it out, you can go read this here. It's got the um, most of the text there. It looks like this was edited somewhat. I have the book uh, that you can buy online, the Nagamati scriptures you buy online the publisher is harper san francisco so or at least that's where it was published that's what it says on the, the bottom corner here i don't know if it can zoom in and see that but <laughs> that's what it says down there so uh let's continue on here uh the imprisonment of humanity the human being adam was revealed through the bright shadow within Adam's ability to think was greater than that 
of all the creators. When they looked, when they looked up, they saw that Adam's ability to think was greater, and they devised a plan with the whole throng of archons and angels. They took fire, earth, and water, and combined them with the four fiery winds. They wrought them together and made a great commotion. The rulers brought Adam into the shadow of death so that they might produce a figure again from earth, water, fire, and spirit that comes from matter, that is, from the ignorant, ignorance of darkness and desire, and their own phony spirit. This figure is the cave for remodeling the body that these criminals put on the human and the fetter of forgetfulness. Adam became a mortal person, the first to descend and the first to become <clears throat> estranged. Enlightened insight within Adam, however, was rejuvenating Adam's mind. The archons took Adam and put Adam in paradise. They said, eat, meaning do so in a leisurely manner. But in fact, their pleasure is bitter and their beauty is perverse. Their pleasure is a trap, their trees are a sacrilege, their fruit is deadly poison, and their promise is death. They put their tree of life in the middle of paradise. I shall teach you what the secret of their life is. The plan they devise together, the nature of their spirit. The root of their tree is bitter, its branches are death, its shadow is hatred. A trap is in its leaves, its blossom is bad ointment. Its fruit is death, desire is its seed, and blossoms in darkness is, is their resting place. But the archons lingered in front of what they call the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is enlightened insight, so that Adam might not behold its fullness and recognize his, shame, his shameful nakedness. But I was the one who induced them to eat. I said to the Savior, Lord, was it not the serpent that instructed Adam to eat? The Savior laughed and said, The serpent instructed them to eat of the wickedness of sexual desire and the destruction so that Adam might be of use to the serpent. The first ruler knew Adam was disobedient to him because of the enlightened insight within Adam, which, make, which made Adam stronger of mind than he. He wanted to recover the power that he himself had passed on to Adam. So he brought deep sleep upon Adam. I said to the Savior, What is this deep sleep? The Savior said, It is not as Moses wrote and you heard. He said it in his first book. He put Adam to sleep. Rather, his deep sleep was a loss of sense. Thus the first ruler said, Through the prophet, I shall make their minds sluggish, and that they may neither understand nor discern. Okay, so that's that part there. And in the book it has like a new paragraph area here. So this one says, The Creation of Eve. And so this is where we're at. Um, all right, good. Okay, the creation of Eve. Enlightened insight hid herself within Adam. The first ruler wanted to take her from Adam's side, but enlightened insight cannot be apprehended. Although darkness pursued her, it did not apprehend her. The first ruler removed part of Adam's power and created another figure in the form of a female, like the image of insight that had appeared in him, or that appeared to him. He put the part he had taken from the power of the human being into the female creature. It did not happen, however, the way Moses said, Adam's rib. Adam saw the woman beside him. At once enlightened insight appeared and removed the veil that covered his mind. He sobered up from the drunkenness of darkness. He recognized his counterpart and said, Now this is... This is now bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. For this reason, man will leave his father and mother and join himself to his wife, and the two of them will become one flesh. For his partner will be sent to him, and he will leave his father and his mother. Our sister Sophia is the one who descended in an innocent manner to restore what she lacked. For this reason, she was called life. That is the mother of the living by the forethought of the sovereignty of heaven and by the insight that appeared to Adam. Through her have the living tasted perfect knowledge. As for me, I appeared in the form of an eagle upon the tree of knowledge, which is the insight of the pure enlightened forethought, that I might teach the human beings and awaken them from the de depth of sleep. 
For the two of them were fallen and realized they were naked. Insight appeared to them as light and awakened their minds. All right, Yaldabaoth defiles Eve. When Yaldabaoth realized that the humans had withdrawn from him, he cursed his earth. He found the woman as she was preparing herself for her husband. He was master over her, and he did not know the mystery that had come into being through the sacred plan. The two of them were afraid to denounce Yaldabaoth. He displayed to his angels the ignorance within him, and he threw the humans out of paradise and cloaked them in thick darkness. The first ruler saw the young woman standing next to Adam and notified, noticed that the enlightened insight of life had appeared, to, had appeared in her. Yet Yaldabaoth was full of ignorance. So when the forethought of the all realized this, she dispatched emissaries and they stole life out of Eve. The first ruler defiled Eve and produced in her two sons, a first and a second. Elohim and Yahweh. So, according to this in the book of John, uh, Yahweh is the son of Yaldabaoth, and Elohim is another son. Um, so that kind of like, it, it's already talking about the Garden of Eden here anyways, and so this is the secret book of John's, uh, this is the understanding that's coming from this, so, yeah. Um, okay, Elohim as the face of a bear. Yahweh has the face of a cat. One is just, the other is unjust. He placed Yahweh over fire and wind. He placed Elohim over water and earth. It would kind of make sense in the Old Testament where uh, Moses was saying that God appeared to him as a pillar of fire. And a pillar of fire being controlled by wind would describe Moses as God with Yahweh and that sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of going into the elements here. So, all right. He called them by the by the names Cain and Abel, with a view to deceive. To this day, sexual intercourse has persisted because of the first ruler. He planted sexual desire within the woman who belongs to Adam. Through intercourse, the first ruler produced duplicate bodies, and he blew some of his false spirit into them. He placed these two rulers over the elements so that they might rule over the cave. When Adam came to know the counterpart of his own foreknowledge, he produced a son like the child of humanity. He called him Seth, after the manner of the generation of the eternal realms. Similarly, the mother sent down her spirit, which is like her, and is a copy of what is in the realm of the fullness, for she was going to prepare a dwelling place for the eternal realms that would come down. The human beings are made to drink water of forgetfulness by the first ruler, so that they might not know where they had come from. For a time the seed remained and helped so that when the spirit descends from the holy realm, it may raise up the seed and heal what it lacks, that the internal realm of fullness may be holy and lack nothing. On human destiny, I said to the Savior, Lord, with all the souls that will be led safely into the pure, or, sorry, uh, I said to the Savior, Lord, will all the souls be led safely into pure light? He answers and said to me, these are great matters that have arisen in your mind, and it is difficult to explain them to anyone except those of the unshakable generation. Those upon whom the spirit of life will descend and whom the spirit will empower will be safe and will become perfect and holy of greatness and will be cleansed there of all evil and the anxieties of wickedness since they are no longer anxious for anything except the incorruptible alone. And concerned with that from this moment on without anger, jealousy, envy, desire, or greed for anything. They are afflicted by nothing but being in the flesh alone. And they wear the flesh as they look forward to a time when they will be met by those who receive them. Such people are worthy of the incorruptible, eternal life, and calling. They endure everything and bear everything so as to finish the contest and receive eternal life. So, before I move on, it's just it's basically saying this is all school of thought. 
This is a giant school for us here. We need to pass it. Some people don't want to. Some people want to throw it away. Um, and it's kind of sad, but... Anyways, let's just keep going here. I said to him, Lord, will the souls of people be rejected who have not done these things, but upon whom the power and the Spirit have descended? He answered and said to me, If the Spirit descends upon them, by all means they will be saved and transformed. Power will descend upon every person, for without it no one could stand. After birth, if the Spirit of life grows and power comes and strengthens that, that soul, no one will be able to lead it astray with evil actions. But people upon whom the false spirit descends are misled by it and go astray. I said, Lord, where will the souls go when they leave their flesh? He laughed and said to me, The soul in which there is more power than the contemptible spirit is strong. She escapes from evil, and through the intervention of the incorruptible one, she is saved and is taken up to eternal rest. I said, Lord, where will the souls go of people who have not known to whom they belong? He said to me, the contemptible spirit has grown stronger in such people while they were going astray. This spirit lays a heavy burden on the soul, leads her into evil deeds, and hurls her down in forgetfulness. After the soul leaves the body, she is handed over to the authorities who have come into being through the archon. They bind her with chains and throw her into prison. They go around with her until she awakens from forgetfulness and acquires knowledge. This is how she attains perfection and is saved. One second here. Okay. All right. I said, Lord, how can the soul become younger and return to its mother's womb or into the human? He was glad when I asked him about this, and he said to me, You are truly blessed, for you have understood. This soul will be made to follow another soul in whom the spirit of life dwells, and she is saved through that one. Then she will not be thrust into the flesh again. I said, Lord, where will the souls go of people who had knowledge but turned away? He said to me, they will be taken to a place the angels go of misery, where angels of misery go, where there is no repentance. They will be they will be kept there until the day when those who have blasphemed against the spirit will be tortured and punished eternally. I said, Lord, where did the contemptible spirit come from? He said to me, The Mother Father is great in mercy, the Holy Spirit who in every way is compassionate, who sympathizes with you, the insight of enlightened forethought. This one raised up the offspring of the perfect generation and their thought and the eternal light of the human. When the first ruler realized that these people were exalted above him and could think better than he, he wanted to grasp their thought. He did not know that they surpassed him in thought and that he would be unable to grasp them. He devised a plan with his authorities who are his powers. Together they fornicated with Sophia, and through them was produced bitter fate, the final fickle bondage. Fate is like this because the powers are fickle. To the present day, fate is tougher and stronger than what gods, angels, demons, and all the generations have encountered. For from fate have come all iniquity and injustice and blasphemy, the bondage of forgetfulness and ignorance and all the burdensome orders, weighty sins, and great fears. Thus, all of creation has been blinded so that none might know that God has, uh, not, so that none might know the God that is over them all. Because of the bondage of forgetfulness, their sins have been hidden. They have been bound with dimensions, times, and seasons, and fate is master of all. The first ruler regretted everything that had happened through him, once again, he made a plan to bring a flood upon the human creation. The enlightened majesty of forethought, however, warned Noah. Noah announced this to all the offspring, the human children. But those who were strangers to him did not listen to him. It did not happen the way Moses said they hid in an ark. Rather, they hid in a particular place, not only Noah, but also many other people from the unshakable generation. 
They entered that place and hid in a bright cloud. No one knew about his supremacy. With him was the enlightened one who had enlightened them, since the first ruler had brought darkness upon the whole earth. The first ruler plotted with the powers. He sent his angels to the human daughters so that they might take some of them and raise offspring for their pleasure. At first they were unsuccessful. When they had proven unsuccessful, they met again and devised another plan. They created a contemptible spirit similar to the spirit that had descended in order to adulterate souls through this spirit. The angels charged their appearance, or sorry, the angels changed their appearance to look like the partners of these women and filled the women with the spirit of darkness that they had concocted and with evil. There's other uh, medieval uh, stories about um, like even some uh, Viking like Loki could shape could shape shift and change into other things um, and even Odin could too he could uh, change into different people and uh, and stuff like that too um, as far as like Norse mythology and all that but anyways uh, they brought gold, silver, gifts, copper, iron, metal, and all sorts of things. They brought great anxieties to the people who followed them, leading them astray with many deceptions. These people grew old without experiencing pleasure and died without finding truth or knowing the God of truth. In this way, all creation was forever enslaved from the beginning of the world until the present day. The angels took women and from the darkness they produced children similar to their spirit. They closed their minds and became stubborn through the stubbornness of the contemptible spirit until the present day. The Hymn of the Savior. Now I, the perfect forethought of the all, transformed myself into my offspring. I existed first and went down every path. I am the, um, I am the abundance of light. I am the remembrance of fullness. I traveled in the realm of great darkness and continued until I entered the midst of the prison. The foundations of chaos shook, and I hid from them because of their evil, and they did not recognize me. Again I returned a second time and went on. I had come from the inhabitants of light, I, the remembered forethought. I entered the midst of darkness and the bowels of the underworld, turning to my task. The foundations of chaos shook as though to fall upon those who dwell in chaos and destroy them. Again, I hurried back to the root of my light so that they might not be destroyed before their time. Again, the third time I went forth. I am the light dwelling in light. I am the remembrance of forethought. So that I might enter the midst of darkness and the bowels of the underworld. I brightened my face with light from the consummation of their realm and entered the midst of their prison, which is the prison of the body. I said, Let whoever hears arise from deep sleep. A person wept and shed tears, bitter tears the person wiped away and said, Who is calling my name? From where has my hope come as I dwell in bondage of prison? I said, I am the forethought of pure light. I am the thought of the virgin spirit who raises you to the place of honor. Arise, remember that you have heard, and trace your root, which is I, the compassionate. Guard yourself against the angels of misery, the demons of chaos, and all who entrap you. And beware of deep sleep and the trap in the bowels of the underworld. I raised and sealed the person in luminous water with five seals that death might not prevail over the person from that moment on. Conclusion. Look now, I shall ascend to the perfect realm. I have finished everything for you in your hearing. I have told you everything for you to record and communicate to your spiritual friends. This is the mystery of the unshakable generation. The Savior communicated this to John for him to record and safeguard. He said to him, Cursed be anyone who will trade these things for a gift, for food, drink, clothes, or anything like this. These things are communicated to him in a mystery, and at once the Savior disappeared. Then John went to the other disciples and reported what the Savior had told him. Jesus Christ, amen. The secret book 
according to John. So that's basically the end right there. It's pretty interesting how, you know, uh, right at the end here, he basically talks about the, he's going, to, um, sealing the person with luminous water, you know, in John, it's described that he's talking to the Samara woman, he's going to give her a water inside of her that's going to be a living well that she'll always have within her. And it says it here too. So, I mean, there's definitely sounds, it sounds very similar to John, but the way it's kind of, you know, Jesus talking to him and John being the best friend of Jesus, you know, I would think he kind of knows what's going on. Um, and uh, I thought, I kind of find this pretty uh, somewhat fascinating um, with the Nagamati scriptures because it's something that you wouldn't really know growing up, especially from some of them Generation X, you know, you don't, you only had the internet for so long, you know, once you finally got it, then you were starting to see more and, you know, hear more and this and that. So you're finally getting uh, some more information that you didn't really know about from the past. And to me, this kind of makes sense in a lot of ways with the fact that a lot of people want to wonder, like, what was Jesus's message after it happened? Well, you got to read the rest of um, the Bible after John. So you'll see what the apostles were doing, where they built their communities. And it was about community and friendship and and all that stuff, you know, all the good stuff that goes along with it. And forgiveness was the stone. As far as I am, I'm concerned, I think the forgiveness was the stone upon which Jesus built the church on top of Peter because of the act of how that all played out. Um, Cause you're trying to correlate the story. What I've been trying to do with all the gospels lately is I've been trying to sort of sandwich them together as far as their respective parts, because most of what it it's sent, like from going back and reading the Bible and and seeing more about what the New Testament was about, um, Mark had a big influence on Matthew and Luke as well. So apparently, uh, Luke and Matthew took a lot from Mark, and it was expounded upon. It was um, you know made a little more in depth as far as the information goes. Some people will say. You know, well, this writer says this time and that writer says that time. How can they not get it right? Well, apparently, according to our time right now, our time value is based upon that. So 2018, it's based upon when they believed that Jesus was born. So were they all getting the times right? I don't think they all had the perfect understanding of mathematical equations and putting dates together. I mean, people have a hard time with math right now as it is. And um, the fact is, uh, most people don't know how to really do any math without a calculator. And uh, that's just the way we are. That's where we're at right now. I mean, uh, even with uh, phone numbers and stuff, like I used to be able to remember phone numbers very well. And um, now with like smartphones and all that, it's hard for me to remember a phone number because it's already programmed. You just, if you don't do something often enough, you forget. And people way back at that time, I mean, they, we're just doing some language here and there, and most people had very simple lives. So to try to put together everything the apostles did in a very formal way, like they should have known everything 100% perfectly, they were just farmers and fishermen. I mean, you're giving them a tough time, <laughs> quite a tough time. And um, they did the best they could. And most of the time, like the gospels were I don't know if the gospel was specifically written by them, by their own personal hand. They probably had somebody uh, do a biography on Jesus, and they told the person about it, and that person wrote down for them, like what seems to be, you know, uh, in Luke. Um, you know, the movie that just came out, The Apostle, um, I think it was The Apostle Paul. Yeah, it's The Apostle Paul. I think it's Luke that's writing down his story and all that. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's kind of hard for some people to kind of understand a lot of these things. And personally for me, um, just trying to grow up and understand a lot of the stuff when, when I had to read the old Testament, when I was younger and I was in school, it just sounded like the, the God that Mo that Moses was following was 
just way too insane as far as wanting to kill uh, people, you know, if they went against them or if they, you know, just just a slight thing. And there was even a part in there where he just go, he starts freaking out and just frying randomly, just random people. And Moses has to go and perform a ritual really quickly to appease the God to, so that everybody else doesn't get killed. And so when I read that kind of stuff in the Old Testament, and I, I'm like, you know, that just doesn't sound like what Jesus is even talking about. Most of the time in John and the other ones, Jesus keeps saying, you're following the devil, you're not following God. And so it makes me wonder, like, what were they following? You know, what, what was going on back then? You know, was it just a bunch of hoopla? Were they just making a big stink about, you know, how powerful this person was? Were they trying to raise him up on a pedestal or something like that? You know, it's... Uh, it's, it's kind of, I mean, you either believe the scriptures for what they're saying, for the context of, as to how they're saying it, or you don't. And some people don't have a, a very big um, ability to believe in a lot of things because they want to believe in what they can see. Well, the fact is you have electricity in your house, it goes through a wire, you don't see that. Even if you strip the wire, you don't see the electricity going through there until you actually pull the, the, um, the copper apart from itself a little bit and you'll see it arc through the air to grab the other end you know and you can only do that so far but there's things that you can't see physically that do exist there's plenty of things there's plenty of different um, wavelengths that you cannot see but they do exist radio waves uh, infrared waves um, ultraviolet waves some people actually can see ultraviolet waves from what I've read so the thing is Sometimes you can't see some things, and maybe some other people can. And But we do know that there are forces that we can't see, like magnetism. If you put a magnet on your table and you put another magnet underneath, it's going to stick to it because magnetic forces are literally going right through the table, you know? And you can't see those magnetic waves unless you do a certain, you know, there's some people that have done uh, particular things now where they can see magnetic waves with the um, I can't remember what the name of the devices that they use right now but there is a way that some people are able to see the, the fluctuation of magnetic waves and all that and so that's what I think you know it's just like when you watched uh, any of the Thor movies you know Thor the, Thor will literally say in the Marvel movies you know what you consider magic is just a kind of science that you don't understand and so that's what I kind of see as, as far as a lot of these old scripture sayings and everything goes. I think there's something there that we're not getting because we can't physically grasp it. And I don't know if it's we can't grasp it yet or we just can't grasp it. It's just not something we're ever going to see. It's just something we sort of believe. It's like the goodness, the creator. And I, here's another interesting thing. Um, I'm just going to put up an afterthoughts. This is sort of an afterthought, afterthoughts for me, if you didn't know. But um, I didn't put it onto this scene, but I'll go over back over here. And we'll just do that like this. And so basically, I, yeah, I'll just do this. <laughs> but, but basically, when I look at things, you either have to look at it like, is it real? Is it fake? What what could it be? You know, and you gotta you gotta try to decide what are you gonna do? You know, are you gonna believe it or are you not gonna believe it? Is it something that you're gonna accept that maybe there's a possibility you just can't understand it or don't understand it because it's something you're not able to see, but it's there? You know, it's just like air. I mean you can't see the air, but it's there. Your body needs to breathe it in order to survive. If you're in a vacuum of space you wouldn't be able to survive because there wouldn't be anything there for you to breathe. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, there's definitely ways of explaining it, but it comes down to the fact is, are you going to believe it? You know, are you going to believe that magnetism actually does work? Or are you going to say, well, I can't see it happening, so it doesn't exist. Well, you can see the effects of it, you know, you can definitely see the effects. And if you can see the effects, then there's something there that you're not seeing, but it's, you can see the after effect. It's like, it's like you have it's like you have a sentence. You have the subject, you have the verb, and you have the object. But for magnetism, you can't see the verb. You just see the subject and the object. And the verb is invisibly there. And I think that's why, you know, when you read these scriptures and stuff, you start to understand that Jesus is kind of saying, 
you're not seeing the verb. You know, you're not seeing the workings of what's going on necessarily, but they're there. And so in the scripture of John, well, you know, initially when he tells the Sumerian woman that, you know, the spirit is like a wind, you know, you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. Kind of like the verb analogy I'm making. You don't see where it's coming from. Or you don't see where it's going, but it's there. You know, you can feel it. You can feel wind on your body, but you can't really tell which way it's specifically going all the time. You know, it could be on this side. It could be on this side. It could be on this side. You know, you can't really, you, you can't quantify it as much, as well as you think you can with a lot of other things. And so I think as humans and, um, you know, as our, as our species go, we always want to put a finger on something. We always want to see something. We want to hear it. You know, if we can do all three of those things, we definitely put it in a category of this is absolute. But science actually shows tons of things that you can't physically see, you can't physically touch, you couldn't hear, um, and they could have different varying effects where if you couldn't hear it, you could see it. If you couldn't see it, you could hear it. If you couldn't, you see where I'm going with this. So the point is, you start to understand some of these things about ancient scriptures and everything like that. And people, you know, people have been contending me all week with this kind of stuff too. Like, oh, what, you know, uh, tell me where you find all this stuff, you know, where there's a physical proof of this stuff. And it's like, are you guys idiots? Like, how am I going to prove something that's 2000 years old besides what it says? And besides going through the entire thing and telling you basically the message of it, how am I supposed to prove that? I can't time travel back into the past, take a camcorder, on Jesus Christ himself and say, hey, do something for me so I can go back to the future and prove it to them. How am I going to do that? I can't do that. And even um, there was a parable in the Bible where um, Lazarus was in hell and the rich man that could have done something for it, or no, sorry, not Lazarus was in hell. The rich man was in hell, Lazarus was in heaven, and the rich man was asking Lazarus to send his brothers out to warn or, yeah, send Lazarus to warn his brothers of the impending doom that was going to happen to them because they were assholes too. And Lazarus said, there's such a gap between us, you know, I can't come over here and give you a drop of water. And, you know, if they didn't listen to Jesus Christ, how are they going to listen to me? You know, so basically it was the point that Jesus being able to do things outside of most people's scientific view of things was totally incredible and um, beyond their scope of reality. And when you try to quantify something that basically goes beyond science, as far as what you can even understand, um, it gets to the point where people just are have a hard time believing. But because of my understanding of things is the fact that there's things you can't see, but they are there. They do exist, they do work. There's things you can't hear, but they are there, they exist, they do work, and on and on and on. So if those things exist, and this is what's purported to have happened, then just the fact of belief, having that childlike imagination that Jesus talks about, the, the, the kingdom of heaven belongs to these little ones, the ones that are like these little ones, because little kids have imagination. Albert Einstein said that the greatest thing ever was imagination the most powerful thing in the world was imagination so if jesus was referring to that he was referring to this imaginative belief where you can imagine this thing being really good this holy source of creation being good and believing in it and because of that you sync up with that and there's some kind of energy there that is able to be used in a good way to basically do what Jesus did. The fact is because of Jesus's beliefs, because he was the son of man, you know, he was the son of the creation. It was so powerful and so profoundly strong that he was able to do things by thought, which people will say, well, that's not possible. There's a lot of 
you know, conversations that will, um, there's, there's a lot of new conversation. I'll say basically that because you think it, you will it, you start to push those things into action and they start to actually manifest, you know, through thought and will and power and, and you know, willpower and that sort of thing. So there's just a lot to this, you know, as I read through a lot of these old scriptures to go, well, there's some, there's some, uh, points of interest there, you know, some things could possibly be what they're saying, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's hard for everybody to, to want to be on the same page. I mean, it's, it's so hard because you have to talk about all kinds of things in order to kind of get on the same page as far as like people's understanding of it. But, you know, when I look at, when I look at, you know, what John was saying, even with the miracles that were in there, and Jesus keeps coming down to the same point. You know, he wants us to be good and caring and loving and forgiving to each other. Now, when they were going to persecute him and send him over, he he had some discern, discernment about certain things, like when I think it was Peter was going to go kill one of the servants or, or do something like that to the servant, you know, because he drew his sword and he struck the, the slave of um, one of the high priests. And then um, Jesus says, no, don't do that because um, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword, meaning... You're living by revenge. Uh, you're going to die by that too, and it's not good to, you know, want to get vindication for it. And um, it's not, you know, and, and just to go and attack and and live for the sake of fighting uh, for that alone. That it wasn't what Jesus was advocating. So some people will say, well, Jesus said, you know, the sons and daughters are going to raise against the parents. Well, that's basically they're going to rise against them because the old ways don't work anymore. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was basically breaking down the paradigm that was back then, uh, the temple worship. That's why, you know, Jesus, um, made a whip and, and got all the animals out, the birds the, threw the money on the floor and all that stuff. He made, made a big, big stink in the temple. And he, he just was like, this isn't what my father wants because uh, selling spiritual favors, because that's basically what that was all about. It was sacrificing these animals in order to appease God so that God would look favorably upon you. And it wasn't about any kind of animal sacrifice. It wasn't about sacrificing really anything. It wasn't about um, using money to gain spiritual sacrifice from God. It didn't have anything to do with that. And so he was, Jesus was kind of upset about that. And it makes sense in a way because you can't sell goodness. I mean, you can't. You just, like, pure holy understanding of, you know, God. He's not for sale. God's not for sale. And I think a lot of people, even today, will want that to actually be a thing. He's not for sale. You can't buy God. Um, you can't buy him with money because he's above all that stuff, you know? And so I just thought I'd go and, you know, kind of talk a little bit more about this. Um, and I, I kind of go on my, a few tangents here and there, because I just, I don't know. It just feels like sometimes I talk to some people throughout the week, and then some people leave me some questions and or d different comments once in a while, and they ask me all these things, and it's like, I don't know how to respond to some of these because some some questions and some comments I get are so trolly or so dumb that it's like I don't I shouldn't even bother answering some of these things because it's just people that want to rip on Jesus and they want to make him look like a fool uh, when in the fact is he's actually telling you the very thing that you've wanted from childhood and the very thing that everybody wants as a family they all want to have a good happy family and they want to have good community He's, Jesus basically said everything that we've all wanted. And he didn't really try to destroy anybody. You know, he's just basically saying, like, if you try to destroy that concept of, of love and community and forgiveness, you try to destroy that and twist everything into being something evil, 
then you are probably going to be, you know, have problems in your life. And that's, and um, even the Secret Book of John was talking about the people that can go to heaven and the people that can't. And, and it uh, basically just describes that the ones that do try to get rid of all these uh, seven deadly sins, which I think the seven deadly sins are, are actually probably demonic forms. And I think the fact is, a lot of people think that only the people that are possessed are possessed, like the exorcist possessions. That I think some people think that only those people are possessed, but I think a lot of people are possessed with some form of demon. And maybe one or two, they might not be big, but the fact is if you find yourself constantly wanting to be, I don't know, greedy or overly lustful or something like that, there's something pulling you towards that. And if you try to take a break from it and think, is there something pulling me towards this? And then you feel so compelled to go into it, you feel like you can't control it. You are. You have some kind of demonic possession. And it's not, I would say, I would say so. I mean, maybe some people would think that's a bit extreme to say that. But I think if you feel like you're being pulled into something and you can't break away from it, then you're sort of in a slavery system of something. You're sort of a slave to something. And could that be like an actual, uh, like, demon, like what you could see, you know, like pictures of demons? Or is it an ethereal blob of negative energy? I think it's more of an ethereal blob of negative energy. And I think in most things that are energy forms are just kind of like balls of light or blobs of energy or something. I don't think they actually have a real form. I think our minds give a picture to what we want to see, but um, I think a lot of people have been taken over by all these just very negative things. And if you notice in your life, I mean, you have such severe depression, so much anxiety, you have so many bad things, you know, going on in your life as far as like the stress level and all that goes, and it's coming from within you, you might want to consider the possibility that there is some evilness that has taken hold of you and it doesn't want to let you go until you decide to cleanse a lot of those sins and start to forgive and start to do good works and you know for others and you start to do this kind of stuff you'll start to shine and by having this light come from within you you start to shine to the point that the negative energies they don't want to be around you they leave because they're afraid of you and that's one of those negative energies too is fear when you have a lot of fear in your life that is a demonic entity wanting to encapsulate you because ultimately we're all these pure holy spiritual beings but we kept getting dragged down into all these evil things that keep popping up in our life and we have to try to find a way to fight it and everybody always finds tries to find some kind of way to fight it and ultimately, it's like, you have to find a way to let go of the fear. That's a good one. That's a good one to let go, is fear. Because even with politics and with a lot of things that happen in other people's lives and stuff, I mean, you got to have discernment, but you got to also realize when it's logically, you know, when it's a logical approach to, you know, do something because something bad might happen. But otherwise, uh, you look at the left and the right politics-wise here in America, and it's just, it just, it pulls you into this depressing state of fear and anxiety. It's like, come on. It's almost like I, like, I personally, I wish I knew more about the politics here, and I'd say that I do know a good amount, but it's, it just looks more and more like either president you choose just a faceplate. Behind it is the whole military complex and the government complex, and they've already got their plan set in stone. And they're going to do it no matter what, whoever is in charge. That's, that's how I see it. I don't, I don't know. I might be wrong on that, but I, uh, I just see so many little things that pop up all the time that just create division all the time. And when everything just keeps creating division over and over and over again, it's just trying to fracture you into a smaller piece, a smaller piece, a smaller piece. And that's why... That's why it's so hard for people to uh, be friends now and, and be friends with each other because you could be friends with like five different things, 
you know, friends with somebody else because of five different things. But then there could be like seven other things that you disagree upon because now there's new extra things to believe in or to do, like you're kind of forced into doing. And it's like, why? Why are all these, why are there all, why is there so much division? You know, why has, why is that a good thing? I don't see that as a good thing. I mean, I just don't. I, I think the fact is when you looked at, when you look at the apostles initially, when they got the Holy Spirit and they were able to speak to other people in tongues with the words that the recipient would understand from their own, from the apostles' own personal language, it brought everything back together and it created a unity. And that's another reason why I thought the Old Testament God was something wrong with that, where the Tower of Babel was broken down, they divided them, split up their languages, and they all moved out from there. That's why I think that most of the stories of origin come from that location of Babel. So I'm thinking you could probably put a lot of their stories together, and bam, you'd have the key. You'd have the full understanding, especially with the Sumerian records talking about the Old Testament God being kind of, well, like the archons that are described here in the Nagamati. So I just see this kind of division and breaking apart as disunity. And even Jesus mentions in the Bible, a house divided cannot stand. And he's basically saying that that is a bad thing. That's a very bad thing. And so when the Holy Spirit enlightens these apostles and they're able to talk to many, many people and have conversations with them and be friends with them and, and things start to become unified in unity, that's basically what Jesus wanted the whole time. And the fact is, like, some people will try to, you know, say to me, like, oh, well, you know, if he came here and he did all that, it would all be fixed by now. No, he's not Superman. You know, we like to watch these. Um, he's, he's not like some kind of superhero in the sense where he's going to stay here and save us every single time we make a mistake. You know, because if he did that, then we would literally just rely upon him for everything and we would just do whatever he wanted and be like, no, he's going to come save me. I can do whatever I want. Because most of the people that like to live in that unintelligent way would literally purposely do bad things for the sake of God or Superman coming to save them at the very last moment. And so what they would end up doing is overtaxing God just for the sake, because they could. And that's not, that's not what Jesus's message was when he told them like, where two or more are gathered and they're sharing and they're compassionate. They're talking about good, holy things, you know, with each other. There I am, you know? And, uh, that was the point. We have to do this. The reason we're here isn't so much that God can come down like Superman and save us every time we, you know, get a boo-boo. We're here for each other so that God can recognize us when we die. So he can be like, oh, I know you. You do the same things I do. You At least you try to do the same things I do. We're friends. God wants friends. <laughs> That's why we're here. If we act more like friends towards each other and good and happy and kind towards each other, Jesus, God, the source, creator, will recognize that and he'll be like, hey, you've done all these things just like I was trying to do them. Maybe not to the highest degree that I did them, but, you know, you followed in my footsteps. And that's basically what we have here with, with humans and all that. We have, we have friendship because we want to make friends and ultimately we wonder like what's the whole world about and everything well basically it's a man and woman coming together being a family making a family creating a family having friendship having community it's all the very basic stuff there's not a lot to it you know and by doing so we learn a lesson while we're here and that lesson that we learn here we're able to take up there so the way that we have the world here and how crazy it is as far as like people not believing at all i mean it's it's hard for some to believe but when some people don't believe at all and they don't want to take any of the facts take anything into consideration at all and they want to fight it tooth and nail it's my belief that those ones are the ones that don't make heaven the ones that are hardcore atheists that have heard the message understood it 
and they think there's a possibility to it, but they want to they wanna harden their hearts. They want to fight it tooth and nail, and they go where they want to go. And I think that's what we are all about. We go where we want to go in life, and if we want to do good things, we want to be nice to other people, and we accept that there is a possible holy source of creation, you know, agnostics and all that, um, and we do good works and things like that, then yeah, you'll make it. I think that's very highly likely. And um, I think the fact is most, you know, the way the world is now, it's like most people just don't want to believe hardly anything. They want to distract themselves with so many things and they don't do anything. I mean, you know, I like to play games too, but I kind of have to take a break from it at times because I just go, I don't really want to play a game right now. I'll just, I just like I'd like to research something. I like to look at something. I like to talk to somebody. You know, I like to go and do something in the real world. Because ultimately, you can't stay online forever. You know, you got to get out. You got to do something. You know, because you got to eat. <laughs> At least you have to do one of those things. You know, so you kind of have to kind of open yourself up in a lot of ways and we've always had things that distracted us from the very beginning of time with sports and uh, you know political views of things and the fact is when you see philosophers and you see other atheists and scientists talk about things like no none of that actually exists none of that works and then they're trying to make things that do those miraculous things with objects here it's like well I think they want to believe, but they want to use their own hands to make it work. You know, they, they want to try to finding a way to manipulate this matter to make it work. But apparently, Jesus was above all this physical matter, so it doesn't matter. It really doesn't seem to matter too much. So I just kind of look at it and I go, uh, you know, you got you to gotta, gotta look at everything. You know, you got to look at everything. And... You know, some people nowadays will, will look at you if you're, like, trying to look at everything and trying to understand everything. They'll be like, oh, it's conspiracy. Conspiracy theory means to conspire against, which means that you're trying to do something bad to somebody. And you have a theory that either you're doing something bad or there is something bad being done. You know, and you didn't, most people don't understand, but de detective work takes a lot of research. Private detectives do a lot of research and they, you know, they, they get a lot of physical evidence for things and they go and find a lot of evidence. Um, people that do a lot of strategy, like Sun Tzu, the art of war, write down, you know, what works for military war and what is strategy other than just a greater overall understanding of detective work, like a, a vast amount to understand what works with a huge amount of people and so basically when I play strategy games I like to look at the overall picture and get everything together try to find all the pieces because you can find what works uh, you can start to figure things out and so when I look at this kind of stuff and I'm trying to like put everything together you know I gotta look at these other scriptures that some people will say oh this isn't a, a part of the Bible this isn't no I kind of have to because it was hidden back at the time the Christians were being killed. And if it was hidden and they were being killed, maybe this is something that they were getting killed for. There's a possibility there. Very highly, po very high possibility there. People would, would have gotten killed, excommunicated, burned at the stake if they said something that uh, the Roman uh, church, uh, what Constantine made at the time, would have said this is a no-no. So they would have been killed, the documents would have been destroyed, this, that, and the other thing. These are very good understandings of what actually does happen, especially when it's suppression of information because we can look at Hitler and what Hitler did with the burning of the books and, ex and the extermination of Jews and the extermination of Catholics too. He exterminated a lot of people. Even Stalin exterminated way more people than Hitler did. People don't even talk about that. And... This has happened time and time again. As soon as a higher physical power takes too much control, they want to destroy every bit of evidence they can find and make sure that they're in power. So they'll find anything they don't like, burn it down, destroy it, 
And the people that are arguing against them, they'll silence them or kill them. And this happens all the time. This has happened throughout history so many times. I don't even have to uh, put up any, like, I've already referenced a little bit of it. I mean, you can look at this more in depth, too. And this is the reason why, you know, we have kind of the world we have with this. And I think it's really lucky and it's good that we actually have these documents because they kind of show more about, um, you know, the understanding of what's to come. Because, you know, I kind of think everybody is looking for some kind of immortality. And a lot of people want to look for immortality here. They want to make this physical body immortal. Part of the problem with that is, who wants to live forever? I mean, I don't know. Some people might, you know. I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe some people have an immortal gene in them. Maybe you can tweak that to make it immortal. But I don't know. I, I think the fact that heaven is described as this just wonderful, awesome place. And, you know, there's things that, you know, I could talk more about, like, my understanding of it and other people's understanding of it and it would just uh it would come down to whether someone's going to believe me or not as far as that so i'm not going to go into all that but other people have had their experiences and as have i and so i mean it just comes down to are you going to believe it or not and when you look at when you look at what jesus was saying with the children and the imagination and how fun and beautiful and exuberant all that is as far as imagining things, even in your dreams. You can have really awesome dreams, you know, and wish you could stay in them and stay there. And, uh, yeah, apparently it's just something that's just, it's, it's something that's just way beyond what we can think of here. And it's just so much better. So, yeah, that's why I wanted to do this. Um, and as far as what I want to do other than this, you know, maybe a little bit more, I think I wanted to read the, the, the works of Sylvanus. I might go over the book of numbers in case people want to actually hear what happened with, uh, Moses and Moses, this is God, uh, the old Testament God. I can go over that. And, um, I don't know if you want to hear that though. It's kind of scary, uh, for a lot of people. Um, which I kind of did mention a little bit of it too, but, um, I don't know if anybody wants to leave some comments as far as what I could read. I have a good amount of, uh, books and so I could go over a lot of things. And as far as what I do is I like to go and research all this, uh, ancient historical stuff because I want to find out what the purpose of this all was. And I feel like I've kind of come to the conclusion. I, I don't know what else I could find. I think when I was reading the this the secret uh, tablet or the Emeralds of Toth, they were talking about the good brothers and the bad brothers. And as soon as I read through the most of it, I was just thinking of Star Wars the whole time because it it seems so reminiscent of Star Wars in so many ways. And maybe George Lucas was was reading that very thing himself and put it down into Star Wars. You know, there's the good versus the bad, and um, you know I think that we have that here in this physical plane to a certain degree as well and um when i but when i was reading that he was describing how toth had to get out of hell and he had to go and talk to the dweller in hell which i guess would have been the devil and he had to do these certain signs and these certain rites and find the right key and the key is apparently hidden in egypt and all that and um he had to find a way out and once he found his way out he was able to reincarnate which is a lot of what a lot a lot of people in the past would believe reincarnation uh, Jesus does mention that um, if you can believe it, uh, John, the prophet, was Elijah, according to the scriptures, too. So whether reincarnation is real or not, I mean, it's described in there, maybe. I mean, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of religions that talk about reincarnation in so many different ways. Um, and some people still contest to it today. Uh, but I think... If that's the case, whether condemnation is like an eternal hellfire or it's eternally reincarnating, um, Toth was talking about reincarnating but back with his own memories. He was able to draw up his energy to the point that he could retain 
all of his memories and just come back here again. And um, if that's the case, even if that's the case, Jesus was trying to get us to stop that. He was trying to end the cycle of the reincarnation. And um, I think the symbol of the cross is actually a perfect fit for that because it's, it's dividing. You know, it's, it's, it, the, as far as the lines are there, you know, perpendicular to each other. So it's, um, it's almost like a perfect symbol in that sense. But um, either way, Jesus was trying to stop everything that was going wrong here, trying to break people free of hell. Apparently, even according to this, it sounds a little bit like there was reincarnation happening before Jesus showed up on the spot. So where are, is that the same thing for other religions? Was Thor that version of spiritual uh, healing and um, taking them away from imprisonment for the Norse people? Maybe. Maybe that was just an understanding of, of Jesus for the Norse. There's so many things that um, actually connect between Thor and Jesus as far as um, Mjolnir being his hammer but has the power of resurrection, uh, being hidden in hell or in the earth by an evil giant, and he has to dress up as, Thor has to dress up as a bride to go down into the earth to get Mjolnir back. And he destroys the evil that's there, and he gets back his, his hammer, which can destroy bad things, apparently, and it can resurrect good things, because it can resurrect Thor's goats, which he eats at the end of the day, and he resurrects them so he can use them to push his cart. So there's just so many similarities because, you know, even Jesus mentions the, the parable of the um, the bridesmaids, you know, that have to be ready. And um, the fact that the veil to the temple tore, which I believe what I remember reading was on the marriage side of the temple when Jesus died. So there's like connections between other spiritual understandings of possibly Jesus or what they understood as a spiritual thing for them. So like when I read a lot of these older documents and, and things like that, it gets really hard because you have to think about it for a while and go, well, are there similarities? And the one thing I think Jesus has accurate is the fact that he'll basically say, you'll know them by their works. And so based upon their works, you can know whether something is good or whether something is bad or whether a character has very similar qualities to another character. And um, so when I read some of these things, I would just wonder, like, maybe Thor was Jesus to the Norse, but their understanding, so that it was better for them to understand in the sense that they got the message in a sense. You know, they got a better message because later on people moved from worshiping Odin to worshiping Thor because the Thor was literally the every man's god. Where as far as Christianity is concerned, we moved from worshiping all the old ways and, you know, what they understood the Old Testament God to worshiping Jesus. So there's the same transition going on there with those two cultures. Now, there's other cultures, too, uh, that I have to look more into detail about and see if there's like a, a similar connection to it. But I think the fact is there's just so much out there. There's so much there's so much to look up. There's so much information in the world. And I think a lot of people don't put hardly any effort into it. Part of the reason is maybe because maybe it's hard. Maybe it's difficult. Maybe you don't have the time. And then you'll watch somebody else tell you something with a gigantic presentation where they're, you know, really popular and you, you just want to gain their message. But the only problem is that half the time somebody is super popular or making tons of money off of it, it could end up turning into a case where they might over sensationalize some things to just to yeah, get whatever they can get out of it, fame, fortune, whatever that is. And um, I think that's a problem everybody can have, you know, because they, they want to follow something good and they think if something's popular, it's good. And sometimes it is. But in a lot of cases, you got to look at what people are trying to say. They're trying to, like, make a buck off you. They're trying, you know, as, as far as spirituality is concerned, I think, honestly, it shouldn't be 
there shouldn't be any money going into that. You should just have it within you and be able to produce it for other people. If you think you're going to try to find some way to spin holiness to flip to make a coin, um, you're not doing it right. Because even the, the apostles will say, you know, the magician wanted to have their ability to heal people so that, you know, because he was making money with his magic. And then he was rebuked. And there were other people in there. And even at the, the end of this, it says this stuff shall not be sold for anything. It's just, it's a very bad idea. So I think I might conclude with that. <laughs> Thanks a lot for tuning in um, later. Uh, if you want to tune into these, it'll be on Monday nights at, it'll be on Monday nights at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, I took last week off. I had a vacation. Um, and um, I've had some people come on and watch, and that's cool. But um, this is something that's really hard for a lot of people. And the fact is, like, what I'm talking about and what I think might be the reality of things is that it's, it's, it's going to step on some toes, really, because a lot of religions will be kind of upset with this because, well, they can't really make a lot of money if, you know, people aren't going to their congregation as much as before. And, um, you know, kind of uh, talking about the Old Testament God like he's not God. And it's an archon. It's just the fact that, like, I've read so much of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament just sounds like there's good parts. And then there's parts that just don't make any sense. And then there's parts that do make sense. But then they're so extreme. It's like, what what is going on here? Like, I don't. I can't understand, like, what is it, how does this make sense? And so many people are lost when they read the Old Testament because everybody wants to go read the Bible and they start with the Old Testament immediately because they want to understand the Old Testament God. And it sounds so bizarre in some situations that you're like, this can't be God. And, this, and half of that is what actually turns away a lot of people from the faith is the Old Testament. And then some people try to understand certain parts of the New Testament and they kind of blow it out of proportion and they don't read all the parts together to get the full message. And um, that's basically what happens with a lot of people, you know, because there was a time in the past where you couldn't read the Bible at all. It was banned from you just reading the Bible. You had to have a priest read it to you. Otherwise, it was just, you know, sacrilegious. It was just not good. And I kind of get that because you can take things out of proportion, you know, especially with there being four different Gospels. You just look at the part with the with the fig tree. Put all of them together and you'll see what the real message is. You put all the gospels together of the fig tree and just read them all together and you'll see where he's going with it. Basically, from what John is saying, from the message is that it's about you doing good works. And Mark is kind of rebuking the whole thing in a sense because he's like, well, it's not season. Of course it's not season, but you're supposed to do it all the time. And Jesus made a physical example to show the understanding of what you should do for the spiritual. That seems to make the most sense as far as putting them all together. It was an understanding. And if as soon as you start reading John, you'll start to see where Jesus is talking about he's trying to do things for us so, so that we can understand the spiritual world in a way without us physically seeing it. We'll see that in the end, we'll see the results. But yeah, that's where a lot of people kind of go apart, you know, from Christianity or the faith. And they, they try to interpret it with an angry voice within them. They don't try to go, well, I wonder what this really means. You know, they don't, they don't do that. A lot of people want to go, oh, he said this specifically. And, and, uh, I, and it, you know, it's, that's angry. Like they just go off the rails and they don't try to like, See, well, what, is this, what did this other person say? What did this other person say? Let me see if I can put it all together and get the full message out of it. So many people cherry pick so many things. And it's hard. But, um, yeah, basically my understanding of the Old Testament is just, it's, from reading the whole way through, it sounds like sometimes what their understanding of God is, there, there is some compassion. It seems like Abraham had a closer understanding in some cases, and some of the other prophets did. Jesus does mention Isaiah a lot. He does mention Abraham. Um, 
And so when I read Isaiah, it, it's like points Jesus out right there. It points out his life or how he's going to be born and, you know, what's going to happen. And But I think it, it's hard to understand all the, the wrath and judgment that comes from, you know, the old <laughs> Jewish understanding of things. So that's a reason why it's kind of hard for me to understand it most of the understanding of the Old Testament God as being God. That's why I'm, I kind of think it was an angel because literally when you read in Judges, uh, when you start to read some of Judges, I think it's the first, second chapter, it goes on to say that an angel is what led them through the desert. Whereas Moses will say it was God leading them through the desert. So it makes me go, oh, what's going on here? Okay, who's telling me the truth? You know, who's saying what? Because Moses was kind of getting rebuked, rebuked by God because God was saying, I don't want to lead these stubborn people through here. I'm going to let an angel go. And he's like, no, 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 no. You know, lead us. God, you know, we'll, we'll do better. And um, so when I read in the book of Judges and I see that it was an angel leading them through the desert, it just makes me go, uh, I don't know. It was an angel. What kind of angel, though? Fallen angel or good angel? Because that was a lot of crispy people that he fried. You know, he, he fried a lot of people, turned them into ashes, like immediately. Do one tiny thing wrong. It was, it, it seems like such a disconnect from what Jesus was talking about, the compassion, the love and all that. And um, so that's why I, I'm kind of more into the understanding that the, the Gnostics were trying to understand what actually went on, what happened, why... Why is Jesus so, so radically different than their understanding of things? You know, why? So I think they were trying to have visions and trances and, and trying to understand him in a sense of dreams. And uh, they got what they got. They wrote it down, and here we are today. And so it seems like that's very likely the case because I have dreams you probably have dreams, and I think we're, you know, I, I think the fact is, like, if you have a religion, you can go to your church, you can go to your, you can go to your uh, community, your assembly, and that's something that works for you, and that's something you feel some real uh, commitment and understanding with, and yeah, you're, you're sharing a sense of community, and that's good for you. Uh, for me, you know, I've got friends and I've got uh, people I know and I share that sense of community with them. So I think sometimes maybe it's different things for different people. And so, you know, I, I think it's not necessarily wrong to keep going to what, really, you know, religious event you want to go to. I don't want to really sit here and like advocate you don't because that would be kind of asinine of me to say that I'm just saying as far as my understanding of things are, I think the real message was about community and about loving and caring and forgiveness and, and that sort of thing, you know, with honest discernment about situations and, and that, all that stuff, all that jazz. Um, and so I think that's basically what it was really about. So I think it's good to have a place to go to for community. You know, it's good to have people you can share the message of, of all these good things with and um, you know and if they reciprocate and it's all good that's great so yeah basically <laughs> I figured I'd wrap a lot of things up as far as my current understanding of all this and just kind of like talk about a bit because uh, some people like to ask me some questions sometimes and it's some of them are frustrating as hell and some of them are kind of easier to get to and um, talk about. And sometimes people get on the same, you know, level that I'm on. And it's it's pretty easy and it's pretty nice to talk with people. But, um, yeah, I just, I kind of have, you know, this is something I'm doing for myself personally. And so other people can uh, tune in and, you know, um, watch and uh and uh, be a part of two if they want to. A lot of people just like to watch some some things like this because most people don't really hardly research anything. You know, they want somebody else to present it to them. And we sort of live in a world of of uh, can't somebody else do it? Like Homer Simpson said, 
and that's a part of our problem, you know. And so some people will watch what I'm doing and maybe they'll copy some of that. That's a good thing, you know. Maybe you want to uh, research this yourself and and see where you know see where you go with it. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's really all I had to say. I think I'll finish it up there uh, next week. I'm probably going to do uh, Sylvanus here. And then the Nagamati. I'll leave a link for the description down below after the video here. But Sylvanus is what page is he on? But I think it was was it Peter? I think it was Peter that was talking about him. And there's a lot of other books in here I could read too. But some of the, like, there's there's one called Thunder. I can't understand what that's all about. Which is interesting. I was like, oh, Thunder, what's that about? And uh, I just couldn't understand where, where it was going, really. So I think really the fact is people try to write down what they understood from a dream or from, you know, what they had a vision of. And they tried to put it down in text form so that other people could, you know, see it later on so they actually had it documented in some way because they didn't have camcorders back then, let's be honest. A lot of people don't even understand that now. I think everybody has a camcorder because I have a camcorder. No, they never had any of that kind of stuff. That just that was never there. So, um, what is it called? The Book of Sylvanus? The Letter of Sylvanus? The teachings of Sylvanus. Okay, that's why I passed it over. Okay, so the teachings of, of Sylvanus. I'll go over that next week. And I think it's kind of long, so I guess I'm going to have to probably segment it. But let me just check real quick here. I can't remember how long this was. But it's mentioned in the Bible. So the teachings of Sylvanus is mentioned in the Bible. But it's not in the Bible. It's here. So that was got that apparently was gotten rid of. Um, and I read through it, and it sounds very good. Like it's it's very good. It's very good knowledge for understanding. Uh, it's literally twenty three pages. So I might be able to get through the whole thing next week, because I was able to read through this very quickly. I'm surprised. Um, so I'll leave that for next week, the teachings of Sylvanus, and we'll go from there and, uh, see what we can get out of that, because I think it was, I think it's Peter that mentions it in the Bible about Sylvanus in the New Testament. So, you know, I, because I was looking at, I'm like, the teaching of Sylvanus, I got the Nagamati and it says Sylvanus in there. I'm like, oh, that's where it's at. Why isn't it in the Bible? Why isn't it important? Okay, well, I'm going to go and read it for you then. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot for being here. Thanks for sticking around all the way. Um, I know I said that like a million times, but thank you so much for being here um, and uh, being supportive. And so um, if you want to see some more of these, uh, definitely subscribe for that. That'd be good. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's all I got. So have a great night, and I will see you next week.